Hi, Chris Potts here. This is part two in our short series of screencasts on the paper by Levine et al. called Systematicity and the Semantics of Noun Compounds, the Role of Artifacts versus Natural Kinds. If you haven't watched part one in the series already, I suggest doing that now because it covers important background and motivations. This screencast is gonna just dive right into the core hypotheses of the paper. So in fact, for the handout, we'll jump directly to section four, which begins working through the paper itself. This quotation here provides a nice capsule summary of the paper, and we'll be unpacking this as we go through the whole unit. And the quotation reads, in this paper, we propose that the head modifier relation found in a given compound is strongly influenced by the nature of its referent. In particular, whether the referent is construed as an artifact, an entity made by humans for a purpose, or as a natural kind, an entity that exists independently of humans. There are two really big takeaways here. First, they're saying that the interpretation of a given compound is predictable, systematic in the terms of their paper's title. Second, they're beginning to identify some of the ingredients in that systematicity, whether the compound refers to an artifact or natural kind. That's something that is, to borrow from the compositionality principle, predictable in some sense from the parts. This first bit of background framing for the paper just serves to help us understand the range of empirical phenomena that they want to tackle. There are lots of different kinds of compounds, and this paper looks at just one class of them, the endocentric compounds. The defining semantic feature of endocentric compounds, at least for our purposes, is that they entail the content of the head noun. So for example, birthday cake is cake, and pinto beans are beans. I find it helpful to phrase this directly in terms of entailment, as I've done in nine here, both because entailment is really important in general and also because it will help set us up to think about entailments throughout this discussion. Now, you might not be sure exactly what Pinto is doing as a modifier in Pinto Bean, and whatever it's doing might not be fully compositional, but we can still say that a Pinto Bean is a kind of bean, that is, Pinto Bean entails bean. For a point of contrast with 9, we can consider the exocentric compounds that I've got in 10. A ladyfinger is a particular kind of cake-like dessert treat. It's not a finger, although I guess they're sort of shaped like fingers, nor is it a lady, right? And similarly, a paperback is not a kind of back. A paperback is a book. For both of these exocentric compounds, it's notable that we write them as single words, I think. And the fundamental observation is that we just can't tell what they might refer to from looking at them. So from here on out, we're going to set aside the exocentric compounds entirely. Maybe they're just memorized lexical items for which we wouldn't expect much systematicity. And at any rate, if the meanings are systematic, it's in an even more kind of indirect sense than we've countenanced even thus far. So we'll set them aside. The second major piece of background info for the paper concerns the distinction between natural kinds and artifacts, and you see that right in the paper's title. We could, of course, have a whole class, I think, that's on the metaphysics of this distinction, but I think it will suffice to have some rough and ready definitions. So just building on what Levine et al. say in the paper, natural kinds are generally not made by people, and they're defined by their essential physical attributes. So you could have in mind things like animals, minerals, molecules, planets, and so forth. By contrast, artifacts are generally created by humans with specific purposes in mind. So you could think about tools, food, art, and things like that. That's the core distinction. Of course, I want to issue a kind of vagueness alert here. The line between natural kinds and artifacts will often be hard to draw. Levine et al. actually discuss this in the fuzzy boundary between these two categories. They consider the challenges posed by living things that are bioengineered, for example, to have specific properties. Those might have artifact-like characteristics, but nonetheless seem more like natural kinds to us. So overall, it will be hard to draw the distinction in ways that capture every case, but there are also clear cases of natural kinds and clear cases of artifacts and it's that clear distinction that we'll be leveraging throughout this discussion. So that's the background, and together with our part one screencast, I think we now have everything we need to state the central hypotheses of the paper. The first hypothesis is the events versus essences hypothesis, which is given in 12 here. 
It says, compound names for artifacts will tend to differ from compounds for natural kinds. In compound names for artifacts, the modifier will tend to make reference to an event associated with the artifact. Whereas in compound names for natural kinds, the modifier will tend to make reference to properties reflective of the essence of the natural kind. So let's pause and unpack this a bit too. By what I said in 9 above about entailment, we know that the referent of the phrase will be determined by the head noun, right? Birthday cake is cake, that's an artifact, and a pinto bean is a bean, that's a natural kind. So we look to the modifier now, and this principle or this hypothesis is saying that for compounds referring to artifacts, the modifier will tend to make reference to an event. Whereas for compounds referring to natural kinds, the modifier will tend to make reference to something about the essence. Our examples in nine, I believe, conform to this nicely. So birthday cake is an artifact with an eventive modifier. And pinto bean is a natural kind with a modifier that refers to its natural appearance in some way. With the next two hypotheses, we actually just unpack the events versus essences hypothesis in ways that will help us with testing the ideas in experiments. First, the event-related modifier hypothesis targets artifact-referring compounds. It says, a compound name for an artifact will tend to have one of two types of modifiers. Modifiers that denote participants in an associated event, whether of creation or use or a modifier that otherwise makes reference to an associated event, specifies its time or occasion or use or its mode of creation. Second, the essence-related modifier hypothesis targets natural kinds. It says a compound name for a natural kind will tend to use one of three types of modifiers, perceptual, environmental, or borrowed. So this is a bit more heterogeneous than for the event-related modifier hypothesis, Perceptual refers kind of to appearance. That would be like our friend the pinto bean. Think also of black beans, kidney beans, green beans, and black-eyed peas. Uh, environmental refers to habitats and origins. So sticking with my bean examples, that would cover cases like lima beans, which are historically named for Lima, Peru, I believe. Uh, finally, borrowed would be beans like cannellini beans, French beans, and garbanzo beans. Okay, those are the basics. What do we make of all this? Well, first, we should just step back and note that if these hypotheses are true, they're evidence of systematicity, and that would already be informative. But let's go deeper. What are the guiding forces behind this systematicity? Are these just like accretions of historical tendencies, or do they reflect something deeper about our knowledge of language and the way language relates to our conception of the world? These are really the big questions that Levine, Glass, and Jurafsky pursue in their experiments, which we'll turn to next.